When I was in college at Johnson, I had a friend who made a decision. And that decision was that he wanted, really, really wanted, desperately wanted to see the Pacific Ocean. He grew up in southern Indiana in this state, so he'd kind of been landlocked all his life. His family had made it to the East Coast a couple of times, but he had never seen the Pacific Ocean. He'd never been that far out west. He really wanted to do that. All he wanted to do was just to sit on the beach of the Pacific Ocean. He didn't care which beach it happened to be. He didn't care if it was up in Oregon or Washington or somewhere in the state of California. It didn't matter to him. All he wanted to do was to see the glory and the majesty of the Pacific Ocean, to visit the other coast. But there was one flaw in his grand plan of eventually seeing the Pacific Ocean, and he had made the decision that he wanted to do it before he graduated college, and it was his senior year, but he didn't have a car. It's a small problem, right? If you want to go traveling and you don't have a car, that's going to create an issue. His parents were not overly thrilled with his decision to go and see the Pacific Ocean, but he was an adult, so they couldn't stop him from doing it, but they could tell him, you're not borrowing one of our cars. And this was college. He was a college student, which meant he didn't have the money for a plane ticket or cab fare or even a Greyhound. He didn't have the cash for any of all of this. It's amazing how inconvenient it can be to have the desire to travel but not have any means of conveyance, right? So you would think that without a car, without money, any other sort of thing, that the dream is dead, right? He's not going to see the Pacific Ocean before he graduates college. Not exactly. See, while he didn't have a car, he didn't have money, any of that stuff, he did have one tool at his disposal, one resource that would give him the opportunity to possibly achieve this goal of seeing the Pacific Ocean before his graduation day. He didn't have a car, but he did have a thumb. He made the decision to hitchhike his way to seeing the Pacific Ocean. Not a great plan, right? See, each and every one of us in this room, we know that that's not a feasible means of doing so. We've heard horror stories of what happens to people out on the highway, especially hitchhikers. It's not a great idea to go hitchhiking, but he was not going to be deterred from his goal of seeing the Pacific Ocean. And since this was the only way that he thought he could make it happen, hitchhiking it would be. He made the decision that he would do this over Christmas break because we had about three weeks of Christmas break. So he felt like that was enough time for him to hitchhike his way out there and hitchhike his way back. And when he shared with us as his friends this grand plan of hitchhiking his way, thumbing rides to get all the way over there, we all told him it was nice to know him. Because he didn't know the kind of people that were going to pick him up, right? He didn't know the character of these people were going to be. We assumed that we would never see our friend again, with the exception of maybe on the back of a milk carton. Because we just know too much about this. And I thought about him a couple of times over Christmas break. I mean, we weren't like super great, totally tight friends or anything like that, but I thought about him once or twice over Christmas break, wondering if he had been able to achieve this goal or if he was about to be on, you know... What was the, the crime show that they did? Unsolved Mysteries, that's what it was. If he was going to be on that, or maybe Dateline, <laughs> if he was really extra special. He wasn't that good looking, so I doubt he would have made Dateline. But anyway, when we got back from Johnson from Christmas break, sure enough, there he was, flesh and blood, living, breathing, not a ghost. So we all assumed that he had just given up on this really terrible dream, and when we got to dinner that afternoon, we asked him about it. We said, so did you finally make it out there or did you realize that that was dumb? And he kind of gave us a sly little smile and said, oh no, I made it there. He had hitchhiked his entire way. He packed up his little hiking backpack from his days as a Boy Scout and thumbed a ride. He said it took him about four days to get from southern Indiana to San Diego, California. He made it not only to the Pacific Ocean, but to one of the better beaches on the Pacific Ocean said it was incredible. He admitted that there were times where he felt his safety may have been in danger, that there was a couple of people that he met. He was really happy to get out of their car when he finally did. But he said he knew that once he had, had slept on that beach, camping out, falling asleep to the sounds of the Pacific Ocean, having just watched the sunset over it, he felt that even though it was a risk for him to get all the way out there, he felt that that risk 
had been worth it. It's kind of an awesome story, and as amazing as that experience must have been for him, if I'm honest with you, I still wouldn't do it. I wouldn't have done it then. I wouldn't do it now. I'm a big guy. He was not. I still feel like I can take care of myself, but I'm not going to put myself in a situation where my safety may be compromised, right? That's a little too big of a risk for me. And we talked about a couple of times here, I ain't much of a risk taker anyway. But I have to admit, when I heard his story, I find myself admiring that he was willing to take on that risk, that he was willing to roll that dice, that he was willing to go and do something so adventurous with his life, even though he knew it was a risk. I think a lot of us in here, we kind of wish that we were a little bit more willing to take some risks in our lives. Maybe hitchhiking is not your thing, but Maybe you kind of wish that you were willing to roll the dice on that career change that you've been thinking about for a long time now. Maybe you had that desire that you wish you would have thrown a little bit of money to that risky stock and now you have to sit back and watch as it skyrockets. I had a buddy of mine who told me that a few years back he had an opportunity to get, to get about $10,000 worth of stock in Tesla, but he passed it up. He said, I'd have been a multimillionaire now. Maybe we wish we would rolled the dice on that. Maybe you want to roll the dice on telling your boss exactly what you think about him, regardless as to what the consequences might be. But there's something about us as human beings that we don't really want to take that big of a risk. We're not willing to, to throw that much behind it and not know what the consequences are going to be. We've talked about that our greatest fear as human beings is the unknown, is the things that we don't know, the things that we can't see ahead of us. And so it kind of makes sense that risk-taking is not something that we're good at. It's not something that we want to do. It's scary to take a risk anywhere in our lives. Even, even especially when it comes to our faith. The last several weeks we've been talking about our need to share our faith and, and how far too often we let our fear of what might happen, our fear of what might end up being the end result of sharing our faith, stop us from doing it in the first place. We struggle with this notion of how much we're supposed to be able to do that. We know that we should be sharing our faith. We know that Jesus expects us to share our faith, and yet it still feels risky. It's still a little nerve-wracking. It's a risky proposition for us to be able to share our faith. If we share our faith with a friend of ours, they might not look at us the same way again. Or if we go so far as to invite a friend to church, what happens if they don't like our church? I mean, I have no allusions to this. I'm not everybody's cup of tea. I'm fine with that. But it can kind of shift the dynamic there. If you love this place, you love this church, you love this body, and this friend that you also care about doesn't, and in fact really didn't like it, can kind of create a tension there in that relationship. It can change the dynamics of how we interact with those around us. It's a risky thing to consider sharing our faith. So it becomes easier to just not. To not let the dynamics of those relationships change. To not risk our relationships in order to share our faith or invite them to come to church. But what if we're missing out on something incredible? What if we're missing out on those once-in-a-lifetime type stories? What if we're missing out on being able to, to share our faith and have the same kind of story as Philip in our text today? We're going to be in Acts chapter 8, verses 26 through 40. And we're going to find out what, what can happen when we're willing to take the risk in sharing our faith. As you're turning to Acts chapter 8, let me get you caught up a little bit here. Last week when we left things off, the Holy Spirit had descended upon the disciples. And in the midst of doing so, it casts out all the fear that the disciples had held that had kept them in that room for 10 straight days. Suddenly, instead of being all together, huddled up together, scared out of their minds, they were boldly and loudly proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. And as a result of the Holy Spirit doing that and casting out their fear, the church was growing like a wildfire. Everywhere they went, they were making more disciples. Everywhere, all throughout Jerusalem, people were hearing about this whole movement of people who were sharing about this guy named Jesus, this teacher that a lot of them had heard about but didn't know very well. 
I mean, we talked about and marveled about the idea that in one sermon, 3,000 people came to know Jesus. It was an exciting time in the life of church because they had cast out fear and they were seeing great result because of that. But as it turns out, there was some reason to be afraid. See, those Pharisees, those teachers of the law, the ones who had killed Jesus, weren't overly thrilled that his followers were proclaiming him, not just having his message, but also proclaiming that he had resurrected. They had done everything they could to try to squash this rumor, and now to find out that not only are his followers telling people that he's, he's alive again, but they're creating more and more followers, and if we're not careful, we're going to lose the people entirely. So they began to persecute the church as much as they could. They would argue with them in public settings, and it even escalated to the point that they killed one of them. Stephen became the first martyr of the church, but he sure wouldn't be the last. And it was almost like after the death of Stephen, these persecutors, these Pharisees, these teachers of the law, they kind of took it like the chains are off. They're all fair game. It was one guy in particular, a dude by the name of Saul, who seemed really enthusiastic about getting rid of the church. And so they were scared, again. But in fact, their fear of what might happen to them led to some of them leaving Jerusalem. But what ended up happening there was that they took the the gospel with them. They were afraid they might die, but they still weren't going to be afraid to share their faith. And so that spark of the wildfire that started in Jerusalem began to spread to some of the other areas because some of those followers of Jesus were taking that gospel, taking that message, and spreading it out. One of them happened to be a guy by the name of Philip, who's in our text today. And Philip is an interesting guy. We pick up on his story in verse 26. There we read, An angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, Get up and go south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert road. Now, here's the thing. We have seen these sort of situations take place before, right? God shows up in some way, shape, or form, and he tells this person to go someplace. He doesn't tell them what they're going to do. He doesn't tell them what's going to happen to them. He doesn't share with them what's going to take place. He just tells them to go. And no matter how many times we see examples of this, no matter how many different stories we have of God doing this with somebody and telling them to go someplace, I can't help but marvel every single time when we see the first part of the next verse where it says, so he got up and went. That's nuts. (laughs) Go that direction. I'll tell you when to stop. Okay. I'm a planner. I'm somebody who needs to know what's going to happen. I need to have a plan in place. I need to know what I'm going to be doing, when I'm going to be doing it most of the time. When I'm on vacation, I don't want that. I don't want a plan. But when it comes to everything else in life, I want a plan. For the record, we've already come up with our scheduled events for 2023. You're welcome. Because your pastor is a planner. I need to have a plan. So this sort of thing would drive me absolutely nuts. To be told to go this direction. Okay, what are we doing? What time am I supposed to be there? Where are we going? Are there any good restaurants around? Those are the kinds of questions I'm going to ask. But Philip doesn't ask that. He just says, okay. And I want to give you a broader perspective here. Understand, the threat of the Pharisees and the, the teachers of the law, this is still a very real thing. Every time the followers of Jesus leave their houses, they're taking a risk. Because they might be recognized, they might be arrested, they might be persecuted, they might face some sort of punishment or judgment simply because they profess the name of Jesus. Every time they left their house, it was a risk. And Philip is not only leaving his house, he's leaving Jerusalem. He's going to an area he doesn't know very well. And he's going simply because the Holy Spirit told him to. Not knowing why not knowing what's going to happen. That is a risk. And in my opinion, that's a fairly big risk. As he's going down there, we we kind of get introduced to this other character, an Ethiopian eunuch, a guy who is serving in the queen of the Ethiopians. Now, historically, Ethiopia in this particular region is one of the only countries that Rome decided we're not going to mess with them. Think about that for a second. Rome overtook the entire known world, except for a couple places. This dude 
happens to work in one of those places. But he had recently been to Jerusalem, and so we're kind of given the impression this Ethiopian is a, a, maybe a Jewish proletariat, that he's at least got some interest in the Jewish faith. And he had come to Jerusalem in order to learn, to, to worship, to be there, to follow through on this desire to know more about this God. And I don't know if maybe while he was in Jerusalem, maybe the, the minister or preacher there just happened to say something that sparked an interest in him. Maybe he had some sort of a question and he wants to know more about it, but we're told that he's actually reading through Scripture while he's driving. It says in verse 28, it says he was sitting in his chariot on his way home reading the prophet Isaiah aloud. There's something about what he had learned while he was in Jerusalem that's got his attention and he wants to know more. And so he's reading through the prophet Isaiah aloud. As Philip is nearing the scene with this chariot, he again feels the pull of the Holy Spirit. But this time what the Holy Spirit to do, tells him to do is frankly, in my opinion... It's a little strange. I mean, we can already say it was a little weird that the Holy Spirit just told him to leave his house in the first place. But now, the Holy Spirit is telling him to go and join that chariot. To just hop on. That's a weird thing, right? Really consider this. The Holy Spirit has led Philip to make his way towards Gaza. The dude just does it. No questions asked. Now the Holy Spirit is telling him to jump upon this chariot that is being drawn by an official of a a, a foreign country, somebody who's high up in the ranks, somebody who's a, a pretty important cog in the gears of Ethiopia. What's he supposed to do? Just stick out his thumb and hope the dude pulls over? That's what he's called to do. He doesn't know what's going to happen whenever he gets on that chariot. He doesn't know how this Ethiopian official is going to respond. He doesn't know if this dude is going to be welcoming of him being on this chariot or if he's going to tell him, get off. Maybe this Ethiopian has diplomatic immunity and he could get killed like in Lethal Weapon 2. He has no idea what's going to happen when he joins this chariot. I'm going to ignore it. We're going to move on. He has no idea what's going to happen when he joins this chariot. But he does it anyway. He continues to do it. He has no idea what's going to happen. This is a risk, but Philip is going to take it. In spite of what might happen, Philip goes ahead. He runs to catch up with the chariot, so I'm already out. This involves running. No, thank you. But he gets up there, he overhears what this Ethiopian is reading. He hears him reading the the letter of Isaiah, and he, he asks him a very important question in verse 30. He says, do you understand what you're reading? He hears him reading through the prophet Isaiah. He recognizes that scripture immediately, and so he asks this Ethiopian, this foreign dignitary, do you understand what it is that you're reading. And i got to be honest with you, I completely resonate when it comes to this Ethiopian official and his particular response. Because he says, how can I, unless someone guides me? If I can confess something to you, something that's been weighing on my chest for a long time, prophecy has never been my strong suit. When I was at Johnson, my prophet's class, by far the lowest grade I got. I passed, I passed. But it was because his mercies never cease. There was actually a part of the final in our prophets class where we had to uh, uh, memorize the actual scripture passage that the Ethiopian is having to read. See, I tied it all in together with this story that's going down a rabbit hole. But anyway, we had to memorize it. Scripture memorization is maybe a close second for the things I'm weakest at. Understanding prophecy, memorizing scripture, I'm in trouble. But memorizing this particular passage of scripture was a big part of our final. So I wrote down as much as I possibly could remember. And then I wrote on the rest of the test, I really tried here. Believe me, I studied, I tried memorizing. Memorization is not my strong suit. Doc Reese took off 10 points. And then he gave me a bonus point for being honest. So I understand exactly where this Ethiopian is here, that he doesn't understand prophecy. Prophecy tends to be very symbolic in nature, where one thing can represent another thing or a whole lot of things. I'm a very linear thinker. I like things to be the way that they are. I thought for the longest time that Animal Farm was just a story about pigs that could talk. 
so this guy doesn't understand. He says, I can't understand this unless somebody tells me about it. And so Philip jumps onto this carriage with him. Before we continue on, I want to remind you of a couple of things that we got to keep in mind that we have to understand to fully appreciate what's going on here. Philip took a risk leaving his house. He didn't know if the Pharisees and the other teachers of the law, if they would recognize him for who he was, if they would try to arrest him, if they would try to get him to to spill his guts and to share other members of the church so they could continue on their course to try to wipe out the church. Leaving his home was a huge risk for him to take. Now jumping aboard this chariot of this Ethiopian who happens to be reading the prophet Isaiah, not knowing how this guy is going to react, not knowing if this guy is going to be welcoming of Philip being on his chariot with him. He's taking another risk. But Philip is about to see this risk pay off. Pay off in a big, big way. Philip saw where this guy was in Scripture. He was reading through Isaiah 53. This is otherwise known as the prophecy of the suffering servant. Most biblical scholars consider this particular passage to be the clearest and most concise evidence that, of the crucifixion, that it would need to take place, that it would be part of the fulfillment of the messianic prophecies. And so as he's reading through this, this Ethiopian has a question when it comes to understanding the scripture. See, the way that it's written is in such a way that it almost sounds like Isaiah might be talking about himself. So he asks Philip, is this, is this guy talking about himself or could he be talking about somebody else? I got to imagine Philip for just a quick second. As all the pieces kind of connect in his mind. And he gets kind of this small smile. He doesn't know why the Holy Spirit told him to head down this road. He doesn't know why the Holy Spirit told him to get in this chariot. He didn't know that the Ethiopian was going to ask him about this particular passage. So he smiles a little bit. It's almost like the Holy Spirit had planned this whole thing out for him. He got to look at his new friend and he He said, let me share a story with you. And then in verse 35, he puts it, Philip proceeded to tell him the good news about Jesus, beginning with that scripture. Philip started right here in Isaiah 53, and he shared with him about the idea that not only has this particular passage come to be, but it's come in the form of Jesus. That the Messiah, that Isaiah and so many other prophets before him and after him talked about that the Messiah has come. The fulfillment of this scripture, the suffering of the servant, the crucifixion for the remission of sins has taken place. That we can now have eternal salvation through a man named Jesus. And it had a profound effect. Because in this one conversation, in this one time that this Ethiopian heard the gospel, the one opportunity that he had to hear the name of Jesus... He has a response in verse 36. It says, as they were traveling down the road, they came to some water. The eunuch said, look, there is water. What would keep me from being baptized? One conversation, and this dude is sold out. He wants to follow through with Jesus' command to be baptized. He wants to follow through with proclaiming his life as being owned by Jesus. Philip took a great risk to get here. He took a tremendous amount of risk. His life was potentially at stake. He could have died at any point in time. The risk was huge. But I bet if we asked him right now, Philip would tell us that the risk had been worth it. See, the reality is is that sharing our faith is always going to be a risk. It always will be. We won't know what they're going to say to us. We don't know how they're going to respond to us. It might change the dynamic of our relationship. It may change the way that people look at you. I'm not going to stand here and tell you that everyone that you share the gospel with is going to immediately have the same response as this eunuch. That'd be amazing. It'd be absolutely incredible. But it's not overly realistic. The reality is that some people may not want to hear what you got to say. 
Some people might get angry at you. Some people may say some pretty hurtful things about you. Some may even threaten you. Maybe some will just choose to ignore you and avoid you from here on out. It's a risk. It is absolutely a risk to share our faith. But some risks are worth taking. Philip was willing to take that risk. Philip was willing to follow through on the command of Jesus. He was willing to follow the guidance and the leading of the Holy Spirit. And because he had done so, this guy, who may never have had a chance before or after to hear about Jesus, not only heard about Jesus, but followed through on that. And I want to remind you, this guy is fairly high up in the Ethiopian government. He's a pretty important cog. And so we don't know the full effect of what took place. We don't know how much this Ethiopian eunuch went back home and started telling people about Jesus. This could have been huge. It could have had a profound effect that is still being felt today. I wish that Luke, as he wrote this, would have given us just a little bit more of the story of this Ethiopian official. Maybe we would have found out that this one opportunity of Philip taking this risk changed an entire nation. It's entirely possible. But it only happened because one follower of Jesus was willing to take the risk and share his faith. In our context, in our culture, we're not risking as much as Philip did. There's not a real high likelihood of you sharing your faith with somebody else that it might lead to your death. I'm not saying that risk is zero, it does exist, but it's not a real high potential. At most, or at least most commonly, if we choose to share our faith and take that risk, people might think that we're uncool. It may cost us a couple of social points. That's about it. People may not want to talk to you because you shared your faith with them. Big deal. Because when we talk about this, if if just the opportunity of us sharing our faith with somebody might lead to one person changing all of their eternity, eternity, don't you think it's worth that risk? Don't you think it's worth maybe a couple of people thinking you're a weirdo? I've been thought I'm a weirdo my whole life. I would consider this to be worth the risk. If we have the opportunity to share our faith, it may be risky, it may be something that's hard for us to do, but if it can change the eternal destiny of someone around us, that risk is worth taking. So be bold. Don't shut out the Holy Spirit. Don't let something so simple as your social status and the fear of losing it be the thing that can convinces you to not share the powerful message of Jesus Christ. Some things are just worth the risk. Hebrews 13, verse 6 says this, and we're going to close with it. It says, Therefore we boldly say, The Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? 